Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to today's program with U.S. Representative Eric Swalwell. This conversation will be moderated by KALW's Rose Aguilar. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do so in the chat section of the live stream that you're currently watching. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but we're dedicated to keeping you informed during this pandemic. We're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programming in 2021. We ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work this year and beyond. Visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can also text the word donate to 415-329-4231 live during this program. You can find this information and more in the description box below. Now, please join me in welcoming Rose Aguilar and Representative Eric Swalwell to Inforum. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's virtual program with and forum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Rose Aguilar. I host Your Call. It's a daily call-in radio show that airs from 10 to 11 a.m. on KALW 91.7 FM in the Bay Area. Tonight, we are joined by U.S. Representative Eric Swalwell. He represents California's 15th Congressional District. While we all watch the attacks unfold on Capitol Hill on January 6th, Representative Swalwell witnessed them firsthand in Washington. He was tapped to serve as an impeachment manager as the House voted to impeach Donald Trump for inciting the insurrection. Tonight, we will address this historic moment in U.S. history and we'll ask Representative Swalwell what he thinks a post-Trump world will look like. If you would like to ask us a question during the program tonight, please ask in the chat section of this live stream, and we will try to get through as many questions as possible towards the end of the program. So let's get started. Representative Swalwell, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, thank you, Rose, and thank you again to the Commonwealth Club for having me back. Well, it has been a long and traumatic four years for so many people. The insurrection happened just 15 days ago, just a few hours after President Biden and Vice President Harris were sworn in. They released a flurry of important executive orders. Today, there was a COVID briefing that was actually based on science. I mean, the, the changes are almost head spinning. And I just wonder, you know, how has the energy on Capitol Hill changed? What is the mood like? Well, truly what a difference a day makes is sort of, you know, the feeling around here. Uh, but it has been a dizzying last couple of weeks. I, I frame it as three Wednesdays. Uh, two Wednesdays ago, uh, we were under siege as our president incited our citizens to attack our capital. The following Wednesday, uh, one Wednesday ago, we impeached that president for the second time in his term. And then just yesterday, we renewed our democracy with a peaceful inauguration. And so what we do next, I think, is critically important. Of course, we have to unite to crush the virus and take on economic inequality and racial injustice. But we can't just sweep what the president did under the rug. And that's really what the trial in the Senate is going to be about, accountability and deterrence, as well as disqualifying him from office. But also recognizing that never again can we allow a leader to take such a wrecking ball to our democracy. And so a lot of reforms are in place right now, uh, legislatively, to try and make sure that that's the case. So let's dive in then and talk right about impeachment. You're an impeachment manager. And this afternoon, Speaker Pelosi said she would send an article of impeachment charging Trump with inciting the insurrection soon. But according to three sources who spoke with the Washington Post today, uh, Mitch McConnell told Senate Republicans that he wants to delay the start of the trial to next month, to February, so Trump's legal team has time to prepare. What are you hearing, and really, how long can this wait? Well, we're ready to go now. Uh, we would love to be in trial uh, tonight. Uh, the team uh, has been meeting every day. Uh, we're prepared. Uh, we also believe that this is an extraordinarily 
unusual case in that the jurors are also witnesses and that the jurors are also victims. And they heard what the president said and they ran for their lives. They saw their desks ransacked and the hallowed chamber where they serve in desecrated. So they, they know exactly uh, what happened. We want the process to be fair uh, to uh, the former president uh, because of, again, the extraordinary circumstance of using this remedy, impeachment and conviction and removal So or disqualification. So we're ready. It's the speaker's decision on when to send them over. Uh, I, you know, And we're also waiting to see what agreement is struck by the Senate, because once the speaker sends the articles over, we're really guided by the rules and the decisions that the Senate make as far as what the forum will look like. You know, when the House voted to impeach, we heard some Democratic House members say that they heard from their Republican colleagues that they voted against impeachment because they actually feared for their lives. Have you heard any similar sentiments from senators? Not from senators. And I think it's important that you know the senators uh, are consistently and, and often briefed on any you know threats to their safety and you know of course we we want everyone to be safe uh, but i don't really want to be a part of a body where fear would guide our decision making um, i'm sorry if anyone has to live in fear uh, we receive uh, a number of death threats uh, weekly uh, in our office and we have for years and it's unsettling and it's hard to explain to your family when the new threats come in. But I ran for Congress uh, and, and I knew in some sense what I was getting into and that these are the big leagues. And in the big leagues, you have to make big decisions and you have to do those without being bullied or making them out of fear. Uh, and I really hope, uh, considering that we've already been attacked once, that we won't make a decision that could lead to another attack like this on the Capitol because bullies will always bully. Uh, and it's really on us uh, to have you know, the temerity uh, and the resolve to stand up and say no more. How do you see the Senate impeachment trial? Can you just lay it out for us? What do you expect? So again, they, they set the rules. And you know, in the Clinton impeachment trial, there were witnesses. Uh, never, never in recent history have there been witnesses providing live testimony in the Senate. In the Clinton trial, of course, there were depositions that were taken uh, and then, of course, video was reviewed uh, by the senator jurors. In the first Donald Trump trial, uh, there were no witnesses. And so, of course, we stand ready uh, to see, you know, what the Senate rules will be. If witnesses are allowed, of course, you know, we'll be prepared to present uh, witnesses. If they're not allowed, again, uh, the evidence here is so um, unique in that the senators themselves are witnesses. So um, we're ready. Uh, you know, it, it would be a mix of you know, arguments and trial briefs, and then, of course, a vote uh, and delib a deliberation and a vote by the Senate. If the Senate impeaches Trump, he would be barred from running for office again. He could lose his pension, which is about $221,000 a year, his health benefits, possibly lifetime secret service protection, and, and even more. I mean, this would send a very strong message. It, it certainly is an extraordinary remedy, as I, as I said earlier, and that's why we want the process to be fair, uh, but we, we think that his actions uh, have led us to do this. Uh, and we're not doing it to be punitive. As, as we have said you know, throughout the process, it's first to hold him accountable for what he did, for who he incited, uh, and what it meant to our democracy on the day that he incited it. You know, It wasn't just any old day in Washington. Uh, we were performing the constitutional duty of certifying the electoral college vote. Uh, it's to deter future presidents from doing this, uh, because no president would try and pull off a coup until the very last days in office. That's when you would try and stick around if you weren't reelected or able to do so. And so we have to show every president that we're willing to go to the last second of your presidency to impeach you and convict you in the Senate to make sure that you're held accountable. And then third, as you said, yes, um, because the president, former president, disdains public safety and our democracy, we don't believe he should ever hold office again, that he will do this again if he uh, is allowed. But you know, on the Secret Service, I, I just want to make one point. I don't believe he would lose Secret Service protection. And, and we're, not, we're not doing that because of this. You know, we, we don't want any harm physically to come uh, you know, to the president, and we wouldn't you know, support anything uh, like that. But you're right, other presidential benefits 
uh, like a pension uh, and having offices and receiving intelligence briefings uh, would be taken away. Representative Swalwell, we have all asked ourselves many, many times how this could even happen in this country. And when you look at the number of votes that Trump got this time around, over 74 million, which really was not a repudiation of Donald Trump, that was more votes than he got in 2016 after all of these policies, especially you know, the separation of children from their families. How are you thinking about this? How did someone like Trump, I mean, there are many layers to it. We could probably talk a whole hour about that. But what, when you think about how he was able to get so many votes, what stands out in your mind? You're right. Uh, and thankfully, uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris received 81 million votes. But you can't discount that three quarters of you know, 100 million people uh, voted for Donald Trump. And, and I don't think everyone that voted for him supports the attack on the Capitol or uh, the idea that you can overturn an election. I think you know, a lot of people voted for, the, for him for their own reasons. And I, I do believe we should try and understand those reasons. Uh, and write policies that, uh, as Joe Biden said yesterday, I, I thought this was so um, appropriate uh, that enough of us can help all of us, uh, meaning that unity doesn't mean that, you know, every single person has to agree, particularly, you know, the people that, you know, incited or attacked the Capitol, uh, but enough of us can agree that you can find a, a great big center, a consensus on health care, uh, on the economy, on transportation, you know, on uh, really getting rid of white nationalism and, and the violence that comes with it, find enough of us uh, to help all of us. Uh, and I, th I think we should seek to do that, uh, you know, in the next uh, two years before the midterm elections. Well, and, and but, you know, it, but you're going to follow up on your question. I do believe that the president's misinformation campaign daily telling over 30,000 lies that the Washington Post added up uh, and gave us, you know, all the receipt. Uh, today, uh, after they finished their tally, I mean that is just jarring to think about. And, and you know he has told thirty thousand lies, and he has you know news networks uh, like OANN, Newsmax, Fox News, and others who perpetuate uh, these lies. And, and we're up against uh, you know these big lie machines. And the big, biggest lie of all was about the electoral college uh, and the ele the election not being uh, just, which again, you can tell that these lies that he's told motivated people to come to the Capitol. And Rose, I just read a, you know, our impeachment team is constantly, you know, just reviewing all the accounts that are out there from people who went to the Capitol. And I, I just read a story about someone interviewed from the FBI today. And, and he said that he was invited to the Capitol by Donald Trump and was told that they were going to arrest members of Congress and stop the counting. And when the FBI agent told him that's, not allowed, he said, are you telling me that I was duped? Mm -hmm. Like he really believed this because he trusted the president of the United States to tell him the truth. Right. Right. In fact, the, the New York Times had a piece about the Proud Boys who feel like they've been duped by Trump. And they basically said, all right, we're not for the GOP and we're not for the Dems. And since you brought that up, I mean, we are learning a lot more about who was actually there. According to the latest numbers, there have been about 125 arrests so far, three members of the Oath Keepers, a former army captain who ran for office in Florida last year, a real estate agent from Dallas, a fashion model from Los Angeles. I mean, if you just type in your state and arrests, you'll most likely find some people. And then federal agents just today found several high capacity firearms inside the Nashville home of the zip tie guy, as he's called now, who was arrested with his mother. I mean, it's just a wide range of people. Based on the videos that we've seen, it was 95% male, 95% white. Given what you've read and what you're learning, what really strikes you about who these people are? Well, we have to, for one, defeat white nationalism. Uh, it, these are people who, uh, you know, sympathize and align with, uh, you know, white nationalism. And uh, this is the greatest domestic terrorism threat our country faces. And that's not me just opining here, that's what the FBI director, based on his threat assessment, has told uh, Congress. And so I really believe that we need to understand how these individuals are radicalized, just as we sought to understand, you know, how, uh, you know, terrorist groups that attacked us uh, before on September 11th and after uh, were radicalized. We need to understand, you know, if there's training 
and indoctrination uh, that takes place because we are learning in some of these groups, uh, and I've read some of the text messages that the FBI has put out in their affidavits, uh, that they have initiations uh, you know, in the groups. And, and so um, certainly there's an order and structure uh, in these groups uh, that is beyond just keyboard warriors you know, showing up uh, to a post for a, a rally. And, and so we really, I think, have to treat this the same way we did you know, to root out terrorism uh, after September 11th. Also, we have to talk about the fact that law enforcement and military members were involved in this. As of yesterday, 35 law enforcement officials from 16 states have been identified as having attended the riot. This is according to the appeal. And then 12 National Guard members were removed from inauguration detail for alleged ties to extremist groups. We did a show about this today, and I was reminded of the report that came out Back in 2009, under the Obama administration, and this report warned about the threat of violent right-wing extremist groups fueled by the recession at the time or disgruntled vets returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. And once this came out, the Republicans just lost it. They, they blamed the Democrats for going after the troops. And then, then Homeland Security uh, Secretary Janet Napolitano apologized and nothing was done about the report. And, you know, there's a former FBI agent, Michael German, who has infiltrated these groups undercover. And he says, look, if this is not taken seriously, this is going to happen again. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Rose, it, it's the part I, you know, I, I hate who these groups are and what they represent and that it's in America, that it's homegrown. But what I most detest is that included in their ranks are current and former military and law enforcement officials. I'm the son of a police officer. Uh, I have two brothers who I'm very proud of who work very hard as police officers uh, in the Bay Area. I was a prosecutor and I worked uh, with some of the best police officers uh, in the country in Alameda County. And I think we have to be careful not to you know, describe this in a way that people look at police officers and think, well, are you in one of these groups? Uh, do I, can I trust you? Uh, you know, will you protect me or, or are you with them? But we can't look away, uh, as you said. And, and uh, in the past, you know, we've not taken this on. And I think we need to really, you know, call upon law enforcement and the military, uh, you know, themselves uh, to step up and say, this is not who we are. Uh, and, you know, we will, you know, get anyone who are in our ranks out uh, who are, you know, engaging or supporting anti government, uh, anti uh, African American uh, or Hispanic. Uh, culture. You know, any white nationalist should not be in any of uh, our law enforcement or military. And, and we have to have those hard conversations. But I think we can do it in a way that it's collaborative uh, with law enforcement, because the people I know, the people that, you know, I hold up uh, as heroes, uh, they are disgusted uh, that people like this could be in their ranks. So I, I don't think this has to be, you know, us versus law enforcement. I think we can all collectively come together uh, to defeat this great threat our country faces. And Joe Biden became the first president to really strongly repudiate white supremacy and domestic terrorism during an inaugural speech. It's really the first time it's happened. So what do you think needs to be at the top of this administration's list to really deal with this crisis? I think we, we need to set up in the Department of Justice, um, whether it's at the FBI or, you know, whether it's, you know, with the prosecutors there, a task force on uh, you know, defeating uh, white supremacy uh, and white supremacy groups uh, that bring violence. Again, we, we need to look at this the same way uh, that we looked at defeating terrorism after September 11 uh, and, you know, expand the resources that we have, uh, find the groups, uh, stop the radicalization, because these groups uh, could bring Oklahoma City-like uh, outcomes, uh, you know, where federal government buildings are targeted or you know, to prove yourself, you know, in a initiation ceremony, uh, you know, taking on innocent uh, black and brown Americans and, and targeting them uh, for violence, as we have read about, uh, is a part of the initiation in some of these groups. So uh, I really think we have to take it, take this on it with the same seriousness that we did uh, post September 11th. And, and sadly, Representative Swalwell, there are more guns in this country than there are people. And I, I hate saying this, but we have to be realistic. All it will take is one person with one of these ARs to do a lot of damage in a short amount of time. How are you all planning to take on the gun issue again? So 
Rose, um, a couple years ago, I proposed um, banning and buying every assault weapon in America. There's about 300 million of them. And I thought that just banning them would not be enough because if you grandfathered in the 300 million that are in our communities, it would take over a hundred years before they cycled out. You know, these weapons are military style weapons. They're made to last for a very long time. Uh, they're durable. Uh, that's why I proposed not just banning them, but buying them as was done in Australia and New Zealand very successfully. One of the individuals who went after me, uh, attacked me uh, for a very long time uh, on uh, on Twitter and Facebook and provoked a lot of death threats uh, that came my way was one of the individuals who was charged yesterday uh, for storming the Capitol. And these are exactly the people who I worry about having assault rifles, uh, that if you're willing you know, to storm our country's capital, break six different police barriers, stomp on police officers, spit on them, beat them, kill them, you're exactly the type of person who should not have an assault rifle. And so I hope that uh, what comes out of this, you know, one of the a phoenix that comes out of you know, these ashes would be we finally uh, end gun violence in America and recognize the true threat uh, that we face when you have dangerous weapons in the hands of the most dangerous people. So the House could easily pass another good bill, but then you have a 50-50 Senate. Frontline yeah. had an amazing documentary yeah. looking at how the Republicans went after Obama about every issue. And after Sandy Hook, Obama thought that gun bill was going to pass the Senate. And it just speaks to where we are right now. Breitbart got a hold of a bunch of a few names of the Republican senators who were going to vote yes. And they railed on them day after day after day. And guess what? They flipped their vote. And Obama was floored. He had the parents of the children who were killed behind him having to apologize to them. So a 50-50 Senate does not guarantee that a gun bill will pass. What are your thoughts about what's going to happen in the Senate? Well, the American people want a gun bill to pass. And a lot has changed in our country since uh, 2012, uh, when those beautiful uh, children uh, were slaughtered uh, and, and their teachers. Uh, Parkland happened. And post Parkland, where those students, unlike the Sandy Hook uh, babies, uh, those students were able to articulate the loss of uh, their fellow students. And then they organized. And they had these 50 mile marches. And they were a part of an effort that defeated in the midterm elections in 2018, 19 NRA A-rated members of Congress. And in the last two elections, 2018 and 2000, the most recent election, more money was spent by gun safety groups than the NRA. And so I really, I do think the dynamic has changed here. Uh, and so uh, members of Congress should no longer fear the NRA, they should fear the moms because the moms have spoken and they've organized and they've voted out people uh, who are on the wrong side of this issue. And so I, I do hope uh, that despite having a 50-50 Senate uh, and considering that a number of Republicans are up in uh, 22 uh, for re-election in the Senate uh, in battleground states, uh, that we really uh, have an opportunity to do something. And we have to do it in the first 100 days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, these kids, uh, they made themselves vulnerable in how they put themselves out there, uh, you know, to engage politically. They're expecting results. And I told them, uh, you know, don't, don't give us a free pass. Uh, don't give Democrats a free pass. We have to ourselves be unified uh, to bring this forward in the first 100 days. One more question about the riots. Do you have any updates about whether lawmakers were involved? Uh, 31 House Democrats are asking for an investigation on tours given by members on the day before the insurrection, even though we don't have any tours because of COVID. And then a lot of people have been reading about Ali Alexander, uh, this reported right-wing conspiracy theorist who said that he planned the rally with three Republican representatives, Paul Gosar, Andy Biggs, and Mo Brooks. Do you have any updates on that? I know that, uh, as you said, tours were not allowed, um, or, or the public was not allowed in the Capitol. The only way someone could get in would be uh, through by a member or their staff. And, and frankly, most staff aren't even in the building because of uh, COVID restrictions. Uh, and so it, it is disturbing and alarming that uh, people have said they witnessed, uh, you know, groups uh, in the Capitol who were wearing similar, uh, you know, t-shirts and paraphernalia as to what they would see the next day 
when the Capitol was attacked. I, that should absolutely be investigated. And if any member was involved uh, in, you know, aiding or providing comfort uh, to those who attacked us, uh, they should be removed uh, from the Congress. Uh, they may even be subject to uh, criminal prosecution. Uh, but, you know, right now I'll, I'll wait, but expect and hope uh, and, and demand, frankly, that an investigation uh, take place. And the speaker uh, has already asked a retired general uh, to be a part of a review of what happened that day. You know, going back to how we got here, I think about voter suppression. I think about gerrymandering. I mean, how else could you get a QAnon person elected to Congress? And um, you know, we live in a, at a time when the minority rules, right? I mean, thinking about Trump not even winning the popular vote and appointing so many judges to the courts who will be there for decades to come. HR1 in the House really takes on these issues. Can you give us an update on? where that is and just will this come out again in the first hundred days? Well, the fact that you know the the number of the bill uh, is, I think, telling because um, I I tell my constituents, if you know the number of the bill, uh, that shows how important it is uh, to you um, because we have 10,000 bills that are introduced every year. Uh, And of course, this is the first one uh, that was introduced. And this is the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, essentially to uh, get rid of dirty money and dirty maps in our politics uh, to restore the voting rights protections that the Supreme Court back in 2014 uh, gutted uh, out of the Voting Rights Act when they found that uh, there was no longer systemic racism in our country, which I think we all uh, have seen uh, since then that uh, that's just false. And so it would you know, get rid of the purging of voting rolls, uh, the long lines, uh, the redrawing of polling locations. Uh, One example that we cite uh, in our legislation is a a Texas polling place uh, that is inside a country club uh, where uh, you can imagine if you don't belong to the country club, how uncomfortable you would feel if you had to go vote at that location. And so really uh, making sure that every American is able to have access uh, to the polls. So we're going to be seeking to pass that in the first 100 days. I know that the Senate uh, will introduce it very soon. I I believe that um, Senator uh, Merkley uh, is leading that uh, in the Senate. And again, we have to make these changes because my fear is that Republicans, particularly in Arizona and Georgia, uh, you know, even the honest Republicans who stood up and did the right thing, that they're going to be primaried for doing that, you know, whether it was the Secretary of State in Georgia or even the governor uh, in Arizona, that they, they will be primaried and state legislators who supported the counting of electoral votes and sending them to Washington who are Republicans will be primaried. And if they are primaried, I think the people who would come in uh, will learn from the deficiencies, their perceived deficiencies of what happened in in 2020 and really work uh, to rig the election in 22 and 24. So we have to get these voting rights reforms federalized and in place before the midterm election. Well, speaking of 2022 and 2024, uh, Representative Swalwell, I grew up in Petaluma, California. And I have seen a lot of changes that I just don't like. I I just drove up to see my parents last weekend and there were so many homeless people on the streets of Petaluma. I mean, you know, you see it in the East Bay in your districts. Here in San Francisco, I live near a lot of people who are unhoused. Inequality is huge in California. Poverty is huge in California. The COVID just made it worse. We, you know, so many small businesses are closing. I can just go on and on and on. You know, we all know. A lot of people are saying that the Democrats have to deliver for the people. Otherwise you could lose the house in 2022. And I know we're only on day two of the, you know, the new administration, but we could, if people don't see tangible changes in their lives, we could get someone worse than Trump in 2024. What are your thoughts about that? And we face uh, Rose challenges unlike any time in our history, you know, with a pandemic, racial injustice, widening economic uh, inequality, uh, the effects of climate chaos uh, on our planet, uh, and just, you know, unrest uh, around the world and the alliances that we've lost. And and so there's a lot of work ahead. Um, But as you said, it really comes down not to the 30,000 foot level uh, on these issues, but, you know, am I doing better and dreaming bigger? Uh, You know, am I able to you know, pay my bills, uh, climb out of, you know, credit card debt, uh, you know, send my kids 
uh, off to college uh, without worrying about you know, how we're going to afford it. Uh, these are the kitchen table issues that people worry about. Uh, and frankly, will my kids be out of my living room and back in their classroom? Uh, you know, can we crush this virus? You know, will we all have vaccines uh, by the end of the year? So yes, th- there is tangible things we can do. I, I believe you know, getting $2,000 stimulus checks out in the first 100 days is critically important uh, for COVID relief. And I hope that's one of the first pieces of legislation we pass in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it also, as I said, uh, crushing this virus and seeing it as a way you know, to unite the communities across America by having all of us play a role uh, in getting people vaccinated. Uh, if you're not the inventor of the vaccine, if you didn't manufacture it, if you didn't put it in someone's arm, you could be a community volunteer who helps get the immobile driven to a vaccine site or bring a vaccine to your community. I think there's so much that we can do if if we're called upon uh, to do it. Uh, And yes, on climate, if you talk to young people, uh, they're very, very fearful and pessimistic about uh, what the future is going to look like for them. A high schooler in Livermore, California told me recently, uh, and I don't know why she's thinking about this. I understand why she is, though, uh, that she doesn't think she wants to have kids when she gets older because she believes that that would be the generation that would see the end of the earth. And, and that's a terrible thing to listen to a child say, uh, but that's how real they feel the threat of climate is to them. Hmm. That is so sad. And I've heard that from so many young people. I also want to ask you, Representative Swalwell, as a representative, I just wonder if you can kind of talk to us about where you fit when it comes to change. Because what concerns me is that because of the way our media system works, I feel like people are so focused on DC and they don't even know who their supervisor is or their state assembly person or their state senator. They don't know what's going on in their own backyard. Now, a lot of the problems that we face at the local level, we cannot address until we have federal legislation. Like we need more funds for the homeless. We need more funds for education. Sometimes money is just needed. That's just a fact. And so can you just, just to talk to us about where you see your role in creating change at all levels, because like San Francisco cannot, or Alameda, let's say, or Fremont, right, cannot solve homelessness on its own. It also needs the federal government to act. I was a city council member. um, And before that, I was a planning commissioner. And before that, I was an arts commissioner, uh, despite not knowing anything about art, uh, which is why I was told I should apply for that, uh, to understand uh, my local community. But one of the most impactful votes that I ever took, I think, not just as a city council member or in Congress, was when in Dublin we voted to pass a plastic bag ban, um, doing our small part, but in being one of the first cities uh, in California to do that. And now that is the norm for most counties, uh, not just in California, but in the country, that you would pay more for a plastic bag and it would be discouraged. Uh, and I felt so bad about it. I took so much heat from people in the community that that Christmas, uh, my gift to all my friends and, and constituents uh, were reusable bags just to kind of <laughs> try and make up for all the heat I had taken from them. Uh, but you're right. Decisions we make at local levels are incredibly impactful. And you don't have to see it as, you know, well, is it really a big deal? It's just a plastic bag ban in one small city. I, th- I think if you recognize that what you do can be a part of a bigger solution and if you inspire others to follow, um, other hands and other hearts uh, can also make a difference. And, and so I think that's why it's important. And I tell all of our interns this, uh, don't go home to your community and start making your plans for running for Congress after you work in a you know, federal congressional office. Uh, find the issues you care about and then find the offices that you can serve in. Don't do it the other way around. I think the biggest mistake a, a leader could make or a public someone who aspires to be in public service can make would be to pick offices and then plot a course to get to those offices. I I think you'll be disappointed. Uh, You'll probably find that you're not going to be successful and you may not want to run again if you don't get to the office that you charted a course for. And I think people recognize that it's just disingenuous. So if you find the issues, uh, I always tell young people, you'll find the office or the commission or the local community group. Uh, But it really uh, is so hyper-local, I think, for what really impacts us in our day-to-day lives. What would you say to people who are, who believe in government, but see that it's not working? 
And, you know, given that I've grew up in California, Northern California, I know that a, a wide majority of cities are run by Democrats. Democrats have a super majority in Sacramento. And yet we have so many problems. We have massive poverty, inequality, so many unhoused people. How do you explain that? How do you explain, I mean, this is another big conversation, but how we got to this point, we're in a state with so much money, obscene amounts of money, there is so much suffering. I think a lot of it, uh, we have to take personal responsibility uh, for like how our decisions affect the whole. And a frustrating uh, decision that I would often see is that, you know, everyone's for protecting the environment and addressing climate change until the tiniest piece of legislation or regulation affects their community. Uh, you know, sure, have dense housing or transit-oriented development near, you know, BART, but don't do it near my home because it's going to bring down, you know, my home value or it's going to bring people into my community that we don't want. It'll make us less safe. And you know, I saw that a lot as a city council member. I saw that. I still see that today a lot in Congress. And I, I think we're better than that. And I, I think it's really on leaders, though, to explain, you know, why these decisions are you know, for the good of the whole. Uh, and, and so, yes, there's a lot on government and, and just, you know, not functioning or not reflecting the the will of the people on guns, on climate, on immigration, on healthcare. We're so, you know, out of balance of where people are when you look at what is actually passed uh, in Congress. But I also think just as citizens, we also have to recognize uh, that, you know, it can't just be me, me, me. Like we, we have to really think about, you know, the least among us and how do you lift them up? Uh, and how do you make sure that our kids are going to be on an earth that thrives and is going to be around? And, and so um, it's hard. And I'm, I'm guilty just as anyone else is, uh, you know, of looking at decisions about myself and my family first. And I try and challenge myself, you know, not to do that. But I, I really think it, it has to be both personal responsibility of the individual as well as the government inspiring people to believe that as communities, we can solve these problems and we're all going to be better off when we do. And, and I want to bring um, immigrants into this because so many undocumented people work so hard in the state of California. We've done so many shows about farm workers, about garment workers in Southern California who are making masks and yet they don't even make minimum wage. Now, Biden's executive orders I mean, it's just incredible to hear what immigrants are saying today, how they're finally able to breathe again because they know they're not going to be deported. And there's going to be a possible pathway to citizenship for 11 million undocumented people. But it's just, I guess it's so hard to fathom that in a state like California, that farm workers would struggle so hard to eat the food that they're picking and to ensure that their kids are going to have a decent education. It's just hard for me to wrap my head around that in a wealthy state like this. It, it, it's not right. Um, it, it shouldn't be the case. And I, again, I, I just think we're, we're better than that. And I, you know, today I saw Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader, you know, after yesterday telling Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, he was proud of them in the Capitol, standing in the Capitol where he had helped incite an attack on just two weeks before. And then today at his press conference, he leads off by saying Joe Biden is allowing 11 million illegal immigrants into our country. And that's the exact number of people who are unemployed in our country and who's looking out for them. And it's just like 24 hours hasn't been passed since Joe Biden is inaugurated. And he's, you know, politicizing, you know, such a emotional and complicated issue uh, that, that doesn't have one wave the wand solution. Uh, and Joe Biden, I think, recognizes the humanity uh, of this issue. And I, I just think the economics of this issue, if that's all you care about and you don't care about human suffering, the economics of this issue show us that we all do better uh, when we have you know, an immigrant uh, workforce, uh, that this country you know, thrives when you look at the Fortune 500 companies by people uh, who uh, immigrated here or are the children of immigrants because it's just a culture of immigration of resiliency. And that ends up doing pretty well 
in business. I'll, but I'll tell you what I want to go away is something I'll never forget. You know, when I was a prosecutor, sometimes I'd get a ride home, uh, you know, from a police officer uh, or uh, an inspector in the DA's office. And I remember uh, pulling up to my house and uh, next door, um, my neighbor was having work done on their house. And I don't know the immigration status of the people who were working in the house, but the first couple of times that I got dropped off in a police car, like they, they would freeze and they were scared. And I just hated that feeling if they were undocumented, that they thought that a roundup is about to happen. And it just, it, I'll never forget that. And no one should have to live, you know, with that fear um, that that's the case. And, and that's the, that's the reality for, you know, 10 million plus um, non-citizens in our country right now. And I think we're, we can do better than that. Mm-hmm. And we should also point out in case listeners have not heard, Biden's going to put, ask agencies to begin reuniting yeah. separated families which is just really on so many levels, incredible. Uh, Representative Swallow, we're getting a lot of questions. So I wanna start asking you some questions from viewers. A lot of people want to know what it was like for you on January 6th. Was it as scary as reported? And how has living through this insurrection really changed you personally? I never thought that the Capitol would be breached. You know, I, I was sitting on the floor and was sitting with a couple of colleagues. Barbara Lee, our mm. Oakland representative, um, was sitting just next to me. And we were all showing each other on our phones the, the footage outside. And we knew there were people outside, but we, we thought, like, this is the symbol of democracy to the world. They're never getting in here. And we saw, okay, they have breached a couple perimeters. They're now inside the building. And then we thought, well, like they're never going to get up to the chamber. And then you see them on Twitter running upstairs. And at that point, that's when Speaker Pelosi was ushered out of the chamber and a Capitol Police officer went to the podium and and told us that many of these individuals were just outside. Let's call them terrorists because they're terrorists, that many of these terrorists were just outside the chamber and that under our seats, wore gas masks and that we should pull them out in case I have to use, you know, tear gas and that our chairs are bulletproof. And that if we were to duck, you know, under them and gunfire came into the chamber that we would be okay. And I'm still thinking that there's just no way, there's no way that they're coming in here. Like this is the United States Capitol. Like surely we were prepared and they're not going to get in here. And I still felt okay. My wife was texting me because she was seeing the images. And it was only once the chaplain of the house went up to the podium, unannounced, but uninvited, she just went up to the podium and started offering a prayer as all this chaos is going on, the smashing of windows and the pounding on the door. It was only when she started offering a prayer that I thought, okay, the, the capital has fallen. And mm-hmm you know, we're going to have to, you know, leave this floor, which I never thought we would leave. And I sent a text message to my wife that no one should ever have to send. She said, are you on the floor still? And I, I said, yes, they apparently have bombs because we were being told they had explosive devices. And then I told her, I love you very much and our babies. And I I didn't know if what was going on outside. I didn't know if we were going to get out of there. And I know other colleagues of mine were making the same text messages. I, at this point, she told me, you know, never send me a text message like that again. Um, My only regret is that I I didn't call her, but it, you know, it was just, it was so chaotic and we were getting instructions. And my best friend, Ruben Gallego from Arizona was, nearby and he had served in the Iraq war. And I went over to Ruben and I said, okay, let's just stick together. And Ruben's wife had been texting me to make sure I watched him. I think she was worried that he was going to try and, you know, stay back longer than he should. So I told Ruben, I said, let's take off our coats just in case we have to like fight our way out. Like we don't want our coats on. So we took off our coats and 
loosened our ties. And he grabbed a pen and said, you know, find a pen in case you need to use a pen. And then they, the police found an exit route that they thought was secure on the south side of the chamber. And on the north side, they were stacking chairs where the glass was being smashed and the terrorists were trying to come in. And so they told us, okay, time to leave. Everyone's got to go. And I'm like a rule follower. So I'm like, okay, police are saying leave. We got to go. And so I start going through the evacuation route. And I see Ruben is standing on the leather chairs, screaming at members who were in the gallery one level up who were trapped up there as to which door they could run to to get out. So I went back to try and get Ruben and I realized he wasn't going to leave. And I just asked him, you know, what, what can I do to help? Uh, and he said to just direct the people in the gallery. And so as I was doing this, I, I noticed a couple of Republican colleagues were pushing furniture against the main door that enters, uh, that, that leads into the, into the house chamber. And then finally, Ruben and I uh, left and we went through a lot of narrow hallways with, you know, a couple hundred people, a lot of staircases um, and went to a secure room. And, and it was actually for a couple hours in the secure room, I was finally convinced that like it was over because you just didn't know at that point how secure it was. And, and they said it was a secure room, but I thought the chamber was a secure chamber uh, mm. that we were in. So I guess the most, so I'm still angry um, that a president of the United States would incite this. And I, I really believe to my bones that had he not invited the mob and told them to fight and not show weakness and told them that he would go to the Capitol, that they would not have done this, that, that he is the central figure in all of this. And so I'm just pissed that we had to retreat from our floor. And that is exactly what he and Rudy Giuliani said at that yeah. rally right before everyone took off. Giuliani said, uh, let's have trial by combat. And Mo Brooks, who spoke before the president, said, let's go up there and kick ass and take names. And of course, the president said it's going to be a wild time, called the people who were before him a cavalry. So again, he had used language, uh, you know, and, and, and by the way, he knows the power of his words. You know, just a couple months before, he was calling on people to liberate Michigan and liberate, liberate Wisconsin. And then what did people do? They went to the state capitals looking just like the terrorists who came on January 6th in their camo gear, in their body armor, carrying their, their assault rifles. So that was almost, um, you know, a, a trial balloon of, or a stocking horse for what would come. Right. And then you have to think about the attempted kidnapping, alleged kidnapping of Governor Whitmer. Right. Again, he, the president knows the power of his words and what his followers, who he has radicalized, uh, are willing to do. We have another question. What is your view on expelling or refusing to seat representatives and senators who engaged in sedition? I think, you know, we have to have an investigation to understand what people did. Look, uh, to me, there's a difference between someone who voted to not certify the Electoral College count. Like that, that's a vote. I don't agree with the vote. I hope they pay a political price in their district. But there's a difference between that person, and there were 139 of them in the House, and a uh, Lauren Boebert, who is tweeting out 1776 and is tweeting the speaker's movements when we're being told not to say anything about the security situation that was unfolding, or a Mo Brooks or a Paul Gosar or Andy Biggs who helped uh, organize these rallies. I think there's a big difference between those individuals and the people who took, I think, a disgraceful, dishonorable uh, vote. Another question, what should be done to improve the security of the Capitol? And it's related to another question about what, you know, what type of formal investigation is planned to get to the bottom, bottom of what exactly happened that day, how this could have happened. The Capitol has to remain open to the public. It's where America's representatives work. And um, this is my second experience with, you know, an attack uh, on our 
Capital uh, with an A, uh, Capital, you know, AL. Um, I was an intern on September 11th, and favorite part of the job was giving tours. I loved giving tours. I loved learning about history and making up a few things just to, you know, <laughs> uh, on the tours to see um, how far you could go, how long of a tail you could put on a kite. It's kind of a challenge among the interns to see who could come up with the wildest stories. And after September 11, the place completely changed. It, it, it was a much darker, uh, inaccessible Washington and, and the security barriers went up and it was just harder to give tours and just a lot of the excitement about being in Washington had gone away. And, and that slowly over time, I think had lifted. And now my fear is that because of this attack, um, the response would be, you know, a locked down Washington where people can't have access to the representatives. And, and that would be, you know, an awful outcome. Now, the Capitol Police is going to need serious, you know, reforms because you don't have to have the Capitol, you know, protected the way it was protected for the inauguration every day. But when a rally is noticed and we know the intentions of the people who are coming and they're making it pretty clear on their social media, it should be protected like that on days like that. And that was a failure. Uh, one Capitol Police officer told me uh, a couple of days ago that he had a day off. He had that day off. And he kept checking in with his supervisor to see, like, are you sure? Like, I will come in because of everything that we're hearing is going to happen. Are you sure I'm, you don't want me to come in? And he was told, no, no, it's, it's going to be fine. He, he said he called his sergeant as everything was unfolding, couldn't get a hold of the sergeant. So he just suited up and went down there without even being asked just to jump in and help uh, his colleagues. I mean, that, that's how unprepared uh, they were. Hmm. Representative Swalwell, we've seen a huge f force by the state at peaceful Black Lives Matter protests, actions for racial justice, tear gas, bean bags, all kinds of things. Another question is, do you agree with the sentiment that January 6th would have gone down much differently if these protesters had not been white? Absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, and it's hard to listen to. It's not hard. It's it's sad to listen to my black colleagues uh, who immediately express that sentiment uh, within hours of the attack that um, just months ago, the Capitol was fortified uh, because spontaneous Black Lives Matter protests were planned. You know, this was a planned event, you know, weeks ahead of time. They called it Stop the Steal. And just in the name of the event, Stop the Steal, suggests that you are capable of stopping something from happening. And if you're not an elected representative, the only way you could stop it would be by violence. And so uh, that's, What's so unfortunate here is that with just a couple of days notice, they were able to fortify the Capitol for a black, a peaceful Black Lives Matter protest. But with a lot of notice, uh, you know, and, and white terrorists who came, the Capitol was essentially wide open. And, and I mean, the message it sends to black and brown people that this could yeah. have happened so easily when, you know, black man is on his way to the protest and he gets arrested. Uh, BuzzFeed had a great piece about the black officers that day who said that they were called the N word multiple times. Yep. They felt like they were just left to fend for themselves in front of a 95% majority white mob. One officer shared that um, a black officer observed a number of off duty officers who were in the mix with the terrorists who were terrorists themselves because you're in the building doing that, who were flashing their badges as they were running through the Capitol, as if to suggest like, I'm cool, like, don't worry about me. I'm also law enforcement. And, and I mean, just to think if that's not the height of white privilege, right, to, to flash your bat, to think that you are able to do something that no one else is able to do because you're a law enforcement officer um, and you're white, yeah. Uh, there just needs to be, I, th I think a lot of, you know, communities of color worked so hard to get out the vote, Georgia, Arizona, these these states. And when you think about it, someone just mentioned this number the other day, it's about 44,000 votes. If Trump had gotten 44,000 more votes in just three states, 
he could have won the electoral college again. That is a tiny amount of votes. And communities of color are saying, you know what, we showed up and we do not want to be forgotten again. And that's why I think the Voting Rights Act has to be passed, you know, immediately. Uh, ideally, you know, first 10 days. Uh, and I know there's the, the speaker. Um, it's a big priority for her, uh, not only because it honors John Lewis, who we lost uh, last year, but because of legislatively what it would mean. And is that, just to go back to what we had said earlier, I do fear that in some of these states, there's going to be blowback against the Republicans who did the right thing. And you're going to see more extreme uh, views represented that are going to make it a lot harder for uh, persons of people of color to vote. Mm. Well, that's where we have to be on that and continually report on that. Uh, we have Representative Swalwell. It's an informed tradition to ask all of our speakers the following last question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? Uh, it, it's funny you ask, and I, I thought about this because I've been on the show before. Um, in the spirit of people like Stacey Abrams who worked very hard to register uh, her community, her state, I, I think that demonstrates um, so vividly uh, that when uh, people of color, particularly women of color, uh, are empowered and have equal access to our democracy, uh, change can come. And so to me, it's just elect more, elect, empower and elect more people of color. Well, thank you so much, Representative Swalwell, for your time. Thank you for joining us tonight at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. And if you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, they've been doing really an incredible job under COVID, please visit commonwealth.org slash online. I'm Rose Aguilar. Thank you so much, Representative Swalwell. Thank you so much, Rose. It's really been an honor to be with you in the Commonwealth Club. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who joined us tonight. Thank you so much. Please stay safe.